Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Supermobile Church, a one of a kind church on the entire planet. Because at Supermobile Church, the homeless are the members. And anyone else that walks in that door, they're your guests. Today's lesson is titled Driving Miss Daisy, Part Two. Driving Miss Daisy, Part Two. But first, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. I ask you to open our hearts, open our minds. Show us in your word the lessons and the learnings that you have for us today. I thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, who came 2,000 years ago, hung on the cross for our sins. And I pray this all in his name. Amen. 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 Driving Miss Daisy, part two. Today we're in the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 12. And if you're in your church Bible, it's already been bookmarked to page 104. Page 104. But if you're in your own Bible, go to Exodus chapter 12. We've been talking about who's driving your spiritual car. Most people would quickly raise their hand and say, Jesus, he's driving my spiritual car. And that would be a truthful and accurate answer. But the real question is not who's driving your car. The real question is, are you a backseat driver? <laughs> Do you say, yeah, Jesus, you can drive my car, but you're in the backseat trying to tell him where to go, how fast to go, how slow to go, what turn to make? Most of us have a real sense of entitlement. We think we know best what's best for us. But we know for sure that Jesus knows best. And I want you to remember the example of a parade. If you're watching a parade, all you can see is what's in front of you at the time. You can't see the entire parade. But if you could go up to a tall building and stand on top and look down, you could see it all. The beginning, the middle, the end. And that's where Jesus is as he's driving your car. He's way up here looking down. He can see it all. But all you can see in that backseat is just what's in front of you. So this having Jesus as your driver, that's a pretty good thing. But trusting him and not being a backseat driver, that's a whole different ballgame. We've been talking about that movie, Driving Miss Daisy. So we saw in that movie from 1989 that Miss Daisy, she had a driver. That was Morgan Freeman, but in the movie it was called Hoke. So Miss Daisy has this driver, and the reason she has a driver is she was getting older, and she wasn't driving so good herself. She has an accident, so her son hires a driver hires Hoke, Morgan Freeman, to be her driver. And Miss Daisy doesn't want any part of this. Mm -mm. She doesn't want somebody driving her car at all because she's afraid she's going to lose her independence. But we know when you let somebody like Jesus drive your car, not only do you not lose your independence, you actually get more. And we're going to see that in the Bible in just a few minutes. And we're going to see what happens when you'll trust Jesus, not only to drive the car, but to do it his way. All right, so today we're going to look at the book of Exodus here, and we're going to go to chapter 12, verse 31, and we're going to see this story of Moses, and we're going to see both an example of backseat driver and not backseat driving right in this story right here. We're going to take a look at this story from a little bit different angle than normal. So it says in chapter 12, verse 31, during the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up. Leave my people, you and the Israelites, go. Go worship the Lord as you've requested. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and go. Pharaoh, you might remember, the Israelites were in slavery in Egypt. And Pharaoh, Moses has said, let my people go, Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said no. And then there were all those plagues and problems that Pharaoh had. And finally, in the middle of the night, Pharaoh calls Moses and says, get out of town, go. I've had enough of these problems with you all. Get out of town and go. Yes. And then Pharaoh says something that we don't normally pay attention to. Pharaoh says to Moses, as he's told them to go, Pharaoh says, and also bless me. This is interesting. Pharaoh doesn't believe in the Lord God of Israel. He's got his own gods. But he's asking Moses to bless him. So this tells you that maybe Pharaoh wasn't completely converted. 
there was like a little bit of a conversion coming. So the Bible goes on to say, the Egyptians urged the people, the Israelites, to hurry and leave the country. They wanted to get rid of the Israelites now, even though they were their slaves, because they had all those plagues and problems and tribulations. They wanted the Israelites out of town. But here's where the story gets interesting. At this point, the Israelites are not being backseat drivers. They're ready to go. They've been slaves for the, for the last 400 years. They're ready to leave town. No backseat driving here. God says, Moses, lead them out, let's go. And the Israelites are ready to go. They're letting God drive their car at this point. So what happens? It says, the Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. This is great. Not only are they leaving town, they're leaving town, the Israelites, wealthy. They're getting the gold and the silver. They're getting the cattle. The Bible says they end up plundering the Egyptians. But the Egyptians want to give it to them. Take this stuff and get out of town. No backseat driving. They're leaving town. They're getting out of slavery. And they're leaving town rich. This is good stuff. Amen, Jesus. You bet you lead the way. They're all in favor of this. Amen. Now, here, here where the problem comes in. They're leaving town, but God tells them to head south. Now, you remember, they were supposed to be going up to the promised land, which was up to the north. It was a trip of maybe 10 days for the Israelites to go to the promised land to the north. God says, head south. And here's where things start to go bad. And here's where the back seat drivers start to try to drive the car. So they're heading south. Let's see what happens as they head south. It says, all the Israelites did just what the Lord had commanded, Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt. Now, the Bible says that Pharaoh and all his officials changed their minds. So they let him go. They let him go with all of this wealth. But Pharaoh and his people, they're going, what did we do? Why did we let all these slaves go? Why did we give them all of our stuff? Pharaoh changes his mind. Now remember, the Israelites are headed south. They're going what we think is the wrong way. Okay. And it turns out what they thought was the wrong way. Pharaoh says, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go, and we have lost their services. What does Pharaoh do? He takes action. He's a man of action. He says he took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them. Where did they overtake them by? The Red Sea. You remember that Red Sea thing? The Israelites are trapped at the edge of the Red Sea, and here comes Pharaoh and all of his army bearing down on them. And Pharaoh's not too happy. He's been embarrassed by this whole thing. And now he's changed his mind. Let's go get them back. Let's go get our money back. So this is bad news for the Israelites. So remember up to this point, no problem letting God drive the car. But now things take a turn for the worse. It says the Israelites were terrified and cried out. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us into the desert to die? What have you done? Now they turn on Moses. The guy that got him out, the guy that went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, Moses was the man, and now they turn on him. They're having trouble, Pharaoh's bearing down, and now they turn on Moses. They say, we could have stayed in Egypt, but now we're going to die out here. They say to Moses, leave us alone, let us go serve the Egyptians. The people want to go back. The Israelites, the first sign of trouble, they want to go back to Egypt. And don't we all do the same thing sometimes? Sometimes we have the first sign of trouble, and we want to go back to what we know. It yeah. might not be very good. It might be nice. It might be slavery like it was here. But they wanted to go back to what they knew. First sign of trouble. And this is where your faith is tested the most. What are you going to do at the first sign of trouble? And will there be trouble? Yes. The Bible tells us we're going to have tribulation. It's not all roses and honey in this life. You're going to have trouble. The issue is not, are you going to have it? But what are you going to do when the trouble comes? So what do the people do, the Israelites? They murmur. 
They murmur against Moses. They're not happy about this, and they want to head back. But God has a different plan. God's driving this car. He took them south. By all accounts, the wrong way. Not only are they going the wrong way, now they're trapped at the Red Sea. And God specifically told them where to camp. So this was all God. God telling Moses, here's where I want you to go. Anybody else would have said, head north. North is where the promised land is. But they head south, and now they're trapped. Now we know the outcome of the story. We know that God parts that Red Sea. Who saw that coming? Nobody saw it coming. It had never happened before. We know the story. We know the ending of the story. But if we'd been trapped at the Red Sea, would we have thought to ourselves, no problem, God's going to part that Red Sea? No, we wouldn't have thought of that. The Bible says that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So when he's driving your car, you have to trust him that he's got a bigger plan. You might be trapped at the edge of your Red Sea and see no way out. But God, he can think of things that you can't think of. Ways out that you don't even know about. That's where the trust comes in. Now, why did the, he part the Red Seas? Because Moses, he's the one that trusted. No murmuring from Moses, no complaining from Moses. He just turned back to the Lord. Lord, get us out of this jam, basically, is what he said. And God did. So they cross over this Red Sea because it's parted. But now, things get really interesting. Pharaoh says, okay, if they can go across... We can go across. Yeah, right. you got to know that Pharaoh, not for a moment, ever dreamed that that Red Sea would come crashing in on him and his chariots. If he had thought for one second that was going to happen, he never would have crossed. He would have said, we've got to find another way to get these people back. But we're not going to drown ourselves. So Pharaoh didn't see it coming, but he starts out with his chariots. They get in that Red Sea, and God lets the water close in on them. And then, what does the Bible say? It says not one of them survived. Not a single Egyptian, not a single one, including the Pharaoh, survived. They all died. What was God thinking as he was driving this car? Why did he take them south? We know the answer now. He took them south to the Red Sea because he wanted to get rid of Pharaoh once and for all. Pharaoh had already changed his mind. What happens if he waits three months and he changes his mind? or a year, and he heads up to the promised land to go get them. God had this bigger plan that the <coughs> Israelites could not see. So sure, they said, God, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. As they leave Egypt with all of the money and leave slavery, God, you're the greatest. And you're, you're taking us south, but that's still OK, because things are really great. But when the trouble came, that's when they became backseat drivers and started murmuring against Moses, but God still bailed them out because of Moses himself. Yes. Moses' trust never wavered. There's a true story that Billy Graham tells. Uh, we all know Billy Graham, the, the greatest man of faith I can think of. Yeah. Billy Graham tells this true story. It took place many years ago. There was a man that was shipwrecked on an island. He was all by himself. Nobody to rescue him, nobody on the island. He was there by himself. It's a true story. And he had built a hut on the island. And the few things that he was able to salvage from the shipwreck, everything was in the hut. Had a little bit of food, had some clothes. He's got this shelter. And that hut was everything to him. It was, it was his life, that hut. One day, this man, the shipwrecked man, is out on the other side of the island. And he's hunting for food. And he sees off in the distance, he sees smoke coming up. And he thinks to himself, what could that be? There's nobody else on the island. I know I've already scouted it. What could it be? And then the thought hits him, oh my gosh, maybe it's my hut. Oh my gosh. And he starts running back to where his hut was. And he comes up over the horizon, and sure enough, his hut is on fire. Everything in the hut was burnt, everything he had. He had no other resources on this island. And he says to God, God, why? Why? It's all I had left. It's bad enough. I was shipwrecked. There's nobody here. There's no help in sight. And now my last hope, my hut with all my stuff, it's gone. Why, God? God, what are you thinking? Why, why, why? And he has this little pity party. And he's basically saying to God, I got shipwrecked and you saved me from that. Thank you. But now this is too much. And he starts to become a backseat driver. 
the trouble became too much. But just shortly after that, he looks out to the edge of the sea and he sees this rowboat coming up. And it's people coming up and it's a rescue party. And they come off the boat and they say, you know what, we were going by in our big ship and we saw this smoke and we thought it was a danger or safety wow. signal. And so we came to rescue you. Do you need rescue? The guy says, I absolutely do need rescuing. God had a bigger plan. God was standing at the top of the parade route looking down. He saw this guy with this hut. He knew it was all he had, but God was looking beyond the hut. God was going to use that hut that burnt to the ground. He was going to use it to rescue him. Similar to the Red Sea thing. The guy never thought in his own head, I'll burn my hut and that'll bring a, a ship to rescue me. But God thought of it. And of course, God brought that ship at just the right time. Yeah. Timing is everything with God. Yeah. In your own life, if you'll let, if you'll let Jesus drive the car and not backseat drive, that's where the miracles happen. That's where you can get blessed when you'll let him drive the car without being a backseat driver. Now, what's this take to let him drive the car? It takes something called faith. This faith thing, you've got to have faith. Now, pastors all the time say, have faith. Read the Bible, get faith, have faith. But it's not quite so easy. Faith is a process. You're not born with it. It doesn't come, you don't inherit faith. Faith is a process that God builds faith in you as time goes on. He'll start to do little things in your life, and he'll do bigger things and bigger things. He won't just throw you into the deep end of the pool. How do we know this? Well, take David and Goliath. When David fought Goliath, Goliath was literally a giant. But what Goliath didn't know is David had already built some faith with the Lord when David, as a shepherd boy, fought the lion and the bear. David had already had some success where God at his side. So when he came up against Goliath, even though that was the biggest giant he had ever faced in his life, God had been building his faith to the point where David said, I can take this guy. Amen. I can defeat him. So this faith thing is something that you build over time. You build it by doing three key things. One is you come to church. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, Amen. hearing by the word of God. Just come to church. That will help build your faith. Get into the Bible. This Bible, remember, not just a history book, but it's a guidebook for your life. Whatever you're going through, it's in here. It's a different time. It's a tech age, satellites, computers. It's a different time, but the problems are all the same. We have the same health problems, same financial problems, same relationship problems. It hasn't changed. Same time. If you want an answer, it's in this book. And the final way to get your faith to build it is prayer. Just go talk to God. I get up in the morning, sometimes I'll just go, God, how's it going up there in heaven with you and the angels? How are you doing? Just talk to him like he's your best friend because he is your best friend. Amen. And finally, back to the movie. At the end of that movie, Miss Daisy, after she's been with Hope for 25 years, after she's built a faith and trust and hope, she reaches out to Hope and she looks him in the eye and she says, you're my best friend. Yeah. Amen. Jesus is your best friend. Amen. Amen. Let him drive the car. Don't be a backseat driver. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Amen. Father God, Lord Jesus, we repent of our sins. Come into our hearts. We make you our Lord and Savior. Father, I pray a hedge of protection over every single person in this church as they go about their day, about their week. I pray you'll keep them safe. You will guide them. You will guard them. I thank you so much for your son, Jesus who came, that we would have life and have it more abundantly. And I pray this all in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.